I want to thank, say thank you to each and every one of you for your support for us to be able to send this uh, exploratory team to Malawi. You know, we have been so blessed as a church because uh, the Lord blessed us with the Matambo family and Martin specifically and his vision for, uh, for that nation. And uh, you're going to hear a little bit about what we learned, and we want to share that with you. But before we do that, I would like to uh, open God's Word to us. We have been looking at the parables of Jesus, some of the stories that Jesus told. And the one I want to share with you, I think, is an apt description of what we found in Malawi. And so I invite you to turn with me to, Mal uh, to Matthew, not Malawi, Matthew chapter 13. And I want to just uh, read this uh, short passage. Jesus actually tells two parables that are parallel here. And uh, I want to give those to you. Would you just stand in deference to God's word for this moment? This is Jesus speaking. And in verse 44, he says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls, and when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, that's a simple, simple story, but what it means is this. There is something so precious that it changes your life. It means that, 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 that something is there and, and I, uh, that you're willing to give everything to obtain it and see it happen. And so we think we found a pearl, a great treasure in Malawi, and we would like the privilege of sharing that with you uh, this morning. You can be seated. We're gonna have the team come up one at a time and just share a little bit of their experiences. We're gonna start with, with Sharon, and then uh, I believe Jim is gonna come, and then Pastor Rich, and then Martin finally, and, and I'll kind of wrap things up. But Sharon, we're so glad she was able to go. Boy, what a difference she made just with the children and the women. And so she's going to share some of that perspective. God bless you, Sharon. Love Pastor Jeff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, going on this trip, um, 
you know, I'm with some amazing men. I'm kind of the token woman on this trip, but uh, you know, you have Jim, who's an amazing carpenter. You have our pastors, who um, just bring so much valuable knowledge, and um, you have Martin, of course, who's an amazing man of God, and his business mind and, and vision for Malawi is, is absolutely amazing. So, you know, what, what purpose do I serve on this trip, right? Well, again, very thankful for our amazing pastor, and he, um, he helped me to find my value right off the bat. So, <laughs> he, uh, you know, we, we, right before going on the trip, my dad, Pastor Rich, um, said to Martin, you know, is there anything we really need to know before going there? And Martin sends back, well, you know, not much, but make sure when you get your cash that it is crisp $100 bills and 2017 or later. You, you don't, nothing lower than 2017. So we get, we get in line for our visas right as we enter in Malawi, and uh, Jeff pulls out a 2013 series $100 bill. Very crisp, very crisp. But that second little detail was missed. He pulls out another one. 2013. I'm like, okay, do you have any 2017 in there? No, no, no 2017. So as a woman who listens to detail maybe a little bit more than some of the guys, I was, I was able to get us through customs and, and get into Malawi. So thank you for allowing me to know my value. <laughs> um, but, but like Jeff said, I, my heart is very tender towards children and um, the women of Malawi and, and the men too. I, I really appreciated being able to see the hearts of, of many of the people from Malawi. Right off the bat, um, driving down the streets, you could really tell how hard of a work, how, how hard workers, every single person that is in Malawi, um, and, and they, have to, they have to be hard workers because their next meal is dependent upon it. The next meal for their family um, is dependent upon how, how, how hard they work. Um, the men of Malawi, you'll often see running down the side of cars trying to sell you bananas or, sh or shoes or uh, something that they made, just trying to make a buck. Um, and the women, wow, hard workers, very hard workers, really devoted to um, their families. And, and, I, and I'm also, I, since coming back, I was often asked, how are women viewed in Malawi? Um, many countries, women are viewed kind of as lesser thans. That's not true in Malawi. The, the, the women in Malawi are very honored and valued. And you could see that um, even in the government school, the headmaster was a woman. Many of the charitable programs, like Ancient Pass, um, the leaders of that were all women. So women definitely are not um, devalued in Malawi. They are definitely honored. Um, a day in the life of a woman. Uh, I actually got to know one of the women across the, the, uh, across the way from the guest house we were staying in, and her name was um, Beline. And she kind of walked me through what the life of a woman is in a typical day. And she wakes up in the morning, grabs water, has to go walk someplace far away, grab some water, huge bucket, put it on her head, um, bring the water back to the family. After that, she's going to go into the field and hoe in, hoe in the, the yard. The women often do a lot of the physical labor in Malawi, um, oftentimes with a baby on their back. They might take a break to feed the babe, um, but goes back and hoes the fields, comes back to her house, makes lunch, feeds the animals. Uh, again, very, very, very manual labor. And at the end of all of that, dad may come home and not have made anything on the street. Mom might have been working in the field all day and not be able to feed her babes. But she's going to keep working hard because she loves them and she wants to do what's best for them. But the children too, hard workers, 
You'll see the little ones walking around also with big baskets of uh, tomatoes on their head or, or pots and pans on their head, um, just doing a lot of physical labor as well. But one of the things that stuck out to me about the kiddos was even when we went down to the government school, there was probably 100 kiddos sitting on a dirt floor, which I'm sure was in one of those slides there. But you also had 50 kiddos outside the window trying to listen in to, to just gain whatever bit of knowledge they could possibly obtain. Um, they, they're hungry to learn more. They're hungry to want to do well. Martin C saw that and realized that there was a need for a, a, a private school, and so he started the Moran Academy. And what I really appreciate about the kiddos that are at the Moran Academy especially is that they have worked hard up to this point learning English, passing some standardized tests. They're smart kiddos, and they're driven to want to do better. But they just can't afford to further their education, which is where we step in as a church to really help support some of these kiddos uh, to be able to get that better education. Um, some of the kids in the school have expressed to me what they want to become. They want to be surgeons, nurses, um, civil engineers. Um, and of course, one of the young ladies wants to also be the president. So ambitious kiddos, and, and again, my heart, I love hard workers, and um, these guys are hard workers, but the difference between America and Malawi is that I feel like in America, you could work hard, and there's enough resources, there's enough opportunity where you could make a better life than maybe you started off as as a kiddo. You could, have, you could make a better life for your family, in Malawi, it's impossible almost to make a better life for yourself on your own, which is where I'm really excited to be able to partner with Martin and for the church to be able to partner with Martin to make a difference in the life of Malawians because they need us. So thank you. Thank you for your support with it. Hi, I'm Jim McElvray and been a tenant friend since Jeff's second year. Um, through the years, I've needed to get out of my everyday life, hustle and bustle, making a uh, living in the USA, uh, going on missions and helping others in disastrous and unfortunate situations helps to set my head right. I'm forever amazed how God's providence has blessed this country from its beginning like no other and uh, I need to be reminded of that. I felt privileged to go on this exploratory mission to Malawi. One of my first day experiences with the Malawi people were the kids. Uh, seeing them heading to school, um, probably with just the one outfit they owned, uh, but clean and with smiles on their faces because they were gonna learn. Um, we entered a government school uh, in a village near Martin's Academy and uh, the first and second graders were sitting on dirt floors. Um, they had a roof over them, and uh, that's a step better than Martin had growing up being taught outside. Uh, but after we visited a couple of the rooms with the teachers and the principal, uh, we're standing uh, on the edge of the schoolyard, and all these kids come running to us. They're waving their hands, they want to shake hands, and I'm like, wow, and it was like, we were Nuwaji, the white people, the white raisins in the sun. Some of those children never or rarely saw a white man or woman, and it's the closest I ever felt to being a celebrity. So we walked back to the guest house afterwards, and we're almost there, and we turn around, and there's all these kids. And it's like, uh, is it recess? And it's, no, they ditched school to follow us. <laughs> They thought we were going to live there. I don't know, but it was wild. Um, I've also worked in construction trades, so um, part of my mission was to help plan and make some benches for a small African village church where Jeff preached. It's called Zambezi Evangelical Church, not part of the Friends Network. Well, as it seems usual for me on missions, I'm all geared up to build something, and uh, the Lord throws me a curveball. I meet with a carpenter who Martin has used, and his name is Opie. 
So I know I'm not going to forget his name. He's Opie from Malawi, not Opie from Mayberry. <laughs> but uh, Opie pulls out his tools we're going to use. And the first thing is a circular saw with no plug or saw guard on it, a, to a death tool. So Opie just sticks the bare wires in a receptacle, and away we go. And uh, when I run the circ saw, I have to lay it upside down or hold on to it to the side. So if I sit it on the ground, it's going to cut my toes off and just run away loose. And Opie has three drills, uh, one, one that drills straight, one that goes oblong as is useless, but he's got a battery-operated uh, drill, but the battery's dead. So um, we're using uh, some lumber that Opie had got. Um, it wasn't two by f uh, four, it was two by four, two by six, not Home Depot variety, not totally squared, so it's a little hard drawing some lines on it, but uh, we press onward. In about two thirds through the project, the power goes out in the whole area. That's Malawi. Um, power came back on, so we finished the benches, or the bench, I should say, and Opie made 11 more f for the church that we were going to go to. He, he finished those throughout the week. Um, Opie doesn't have enough work and money to buy workable, safe tools, but he makes do. That is what most Malawian people do with a 92% unemployment rate. As we traveled the roads around the capital city of Lilongwe and the country, I saw men pushing bicycles loaded up high with wood, firewood, going up huge hills, big inclines to go to market and sell it. They had to tra travel many miles too, and hopefully just to make $2.50 a day if they could to feed their family. You make a better living here in the USA standing at the bottom of a freeway ramp panhandling. I saw guys welding and making metal doors, making metal pots, cane furniture, and just about everything on the market's roadside. Everybody is a brick mason in this country as they make their own bricks and build their own homes and walls. Um, many homes in the country half finished because they don't have the money to finish it, they have to make it as they go along. Uh, the bank interest rate, 40%, so that's out of the way. But a lot of these people have faith and know the Lord. There are many churches. We went to the refugee camp of 50,000 people with over 200 churches in it. In all this abject poverty, people smile, and especially the children. They have joy in the Lord. Uh, so lastly, I want to mention Moran Academy and Martin. Over the years, Martin has been at Friends. I didn't know him well. Uh, we bunked together on this mission week, so I got to hear his heart and his dreams to give back to his home country with the love of Jesus. Moran Academy is a diamond surrounded by the rough. Martin's efforts, money, and help from his brother's blessing to, in Malawi, his brother's just dynamite. Um, unbelievable guy. They're astounding and awesome. As a church, we have boots on the ground at Moran Academy. It is changing lives in young adults who no doubt in my mind will do great things and help to change Malawi. With their strong faith in the Lord and hard work, they will succeed. Martin has been telling them that, and he is proof of it. I want to begin by simply saying that it was indeed a privilege of a lifetime to visit the country of Malawi a country that is near and dear to my family, my wife's family, as her family has given themselves to that country and to the kingdom of God for three generations with a labor of love for the people. I also want to acknowledge for just a moment Martin's brother Blessings, what a perfect name for a brother, and his wife Twela, who, um, who were so gracious 
uh, to us and um, gave me complete confidence that I can go to Malawi anytime without Martin because I know blessings will take care of me. I want to begin by just simply asking you a question. Where do you go to find hospitality? Or where have you seen hope? In our time in Malawi, I discovered hospitality winding down a dirt and dusty and bumpy road to go into a village that was miles off the main road. And there, had the chance to experience the life and a home of the Malawan people. Where did I find hope? I found it in the Zaleka refugee camp. Camp built 20 years ago for 12,000 people. It has literally become a city of 52,000 people up and down two hillsides filled with refugees from DRC, Burundi, Rwanda over the years. When you visit the village and when you visit the refugee camp, your heart can be overwhelmed with wanting to do something. But everything that, you come, that comes to your mind just seems to be a drop in a bucket, which is in fact a great ocean of need. But I'll never forget the hospitality that we experienced. We had an honor to meet Beatrice, a grandmother in the village, who opened up her home to us, the American strangers, to let us see this little two-room house. One room was a living area, the other was a bedroom for five. Dirt floor, the crack of sunlight through the ceiling, the thatched roof. Most of us would have been embarrassed to show such a house, but she was filled with joy to show us her home. And I don't know if you caught it, but on that wall in chalk read these words, may God be with us in this home. While we were in the village, we also had the opportunity to experience life in a garden with a young woman who then brought us into her kitchen, which really wasn't a kitchen, but she demonstrated making some Malawan food for us. Meanwhile, we played and interacted with the children and they just came to hang out with us and we had all kinds of fun playing tag and throwing them up in the air and doing chants with them. And towards the end of our stay, we thought it would be a great idea to hand out lollipops to all the kids. In my American mind, I figured we could pass that out in a logical manner so that every child could get one. Instead, we produced a mob scene. That, feeling, that left us feeling like we made more of a mess then we were help. But I could see us going back to that village, not with lollipops, but running a, a VBS for a day or two to create food boxes that we could give to the families that will bring them a little bit of extra help. Or maybe even building a playground for the children. As I reflect upon the experience of the refugee camp, it really is truly almost impossible to put into words what we experienced. Families are there left to try to make ends meet, creating little businesses and doing whatever little farming they can on a little plot of land. 
for assistance, they're given five kwacha per person a month. That's $3.50. I was struck by the conversation we had with a young man named Pacific who gave us the tour around the refugee camp. He had grown up there from as a child and is now a young adult and he volunteers at Ancient Path, which is a Christian ministry in Malawi. And as we're walking around this in the midst of this mass of humanity in such tight quarters, he told us that this camp represents hope for those who live there. Hope? How? What? Where? And then he went on to say that if we stayed in our homeland, our lives most likely would have ended in certain death. A refugee camp. Hope for a future. Amazingly, there are over 200 little churches in that refugee camp where Jesus is their hope and their future. So what did I learn? No matter where I am in the U.S. or in Malawi, and I will go back, whether I have a lot to give or a little, there are two things that I can always give every day of my life. A spirit of hospitality to another and a spirit of hope. Even if it's done in the simple action of placing my hand in the hand of a child or on their head and simply saying, may God bless you. Thank you. for me it's, um, it's been an, an emotional trip going to Malawi with Pastor Jeff and Pastor Reed and Jim and my sister Sharon um, obviously growing up as a kid now usually you you develop a vision and a dream based on what you see and both of my parents had no education and all I knew was what you see in the pictures. Where did my dream to dream big? And to see myself in the United States. At a point in time, I remember where I would say that I am an American. And after more than 20 years of being in the United States, I became an American citizen. But I found education as, as a key. But above all, I see God using education to have brought me this far. I learned outside under a tree for many years. I went to school without shoes for nine years. I reflect on, at the age of 16, I was still doing my sixth grade in Malawi and Zambia. Then my daughter, at 16, she was doing 11th grade. I was doing sixth grade without shoes. The Lord has blessed me that through it all, he's brought me this far. I came to this country with exactly $500 in my pocket. It'd be a long story to tell you how. Today, I've gone back and building schools for kids in Malawi. I'm so grateful for this church, for embracing us with my family, and for partnering with us. When I see the kids in Malawi walking those streets that I used to walk, I see myself in them. 
And I see some of those kids are way brighter than I could ever have ever imagined. And if we can only give them support. I'm so grateful. You know, every time I visualize as I'm working towards it, and the Lord finds a way to bless it and bring it to fruition. I've been sharing more than four years sharing with Pastor Rich on, on the vision that I have for a church to come to Malawi. I kept singing it. I'm so honored and humbled that you allowed the senior pastor of the church, Pastor Rich, to come to Malawi. See, Malawi is my home. I have every reason to be in Malawi and to do what I'm doing in Malawi. But to see them come to Malawi, to see this church support the work we're doing in Malawi, you've given me a hope to, to even have more faith. We launched an academy. I told my wife, we're going to launch the school without. We're going to have the kids come to school for free because we know they can't afford it. One day I sent an email to uh, our distribution and Pastor Rich sends me an email. How much does it cost to sponsor a child? The next thing he calls me, our church is going to sponsor 10 kids. The next thing we have 10. So Marine Academy now has 64 students. 15 are sponsored by this church and two or three more are sponsored by other individuals from our church that reached out over and above so that we can send these kids to, to school. I'm humbled. I'm grateful. You've allowed it to mock even more by faith and I was saying the morning service with you that most of the times I will visualize and have a vision. I don't know the rest of the details. In any of the things that I've been uh, visualizing about Malawi and the academy, there was no detail of Pastor Jeff coming to Malawi and Pastor Rick. And I so said, God takes care of the details. I, I, I had no idea Jim would come to Malawi, Sharon would come to Malawi. And these people came down to Malawi and loved the kids, went into the villages, and the, these kids just mobbed us. And I could see Sharon you know, coming down to the kids, disabled women, and she would hug them and just kiss them and just show them the love of God. I was so touched. I'm humbled, I'm grateful, and thank you for giving us this opportunity and the partnership with the church to serve the people of Malawi and to show them the love of God. Thank you. Stay here. You can see we look like brothers today. Uh, we, we have uh, these uh, outfits or shirts were given to us by the, uh, the staff at the Moran Academy. And so it's a real honor and a blessing to us to be able to, to wear those uh, with pride. Otherwise, I'd be wearing something Buckeye gear. But, uh, we'll, but uh, today I'm a Malawian and uh, so privileged to have been a part of this trip and to be a part of this vision that Martin has cast. And, and, and this vision that he's given us is bigger than himself. It's bigger than his family. It's something that, that you know, God-sized visions take uh, God-sized miracles to occur. And what we were able to see is how God is doing an actual miracle uh, to, to, to envision an academy, which is so pristine. In a country of chaos, you see this 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 academy rising up, an oasis in the desert almost, where, where you see uh, 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 landscaping and beautiful uh, buildings and opportunity and the, the uh, students all dressed up and learning. It, it's, it's extraordinarily exciting. Now, we've got some work to do. He's got a building, uh, one more classroom he wants to finish, $15,000. We're going to figure out as a church, how to raise that $15,000 to get that done because it, it, it would be a help. See, we, have, we started four years ago sponsoring those students. We met those that, that fourth, they're, they're going to graduate this year. We met those initial students and we're going to see them graduate this year. What a blessing and what an opportunity for us. I'll tell you, probably one of the most humbling moments of my life, and I had a couple during, uh, during our time there. But on my birthday, uh, 
the academy, we were supposed to go over there about 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning, and somehow we got delayed, and I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but, but I know that we arrived late, 11 o'clock. The students had been waiting outside uh, patiently for about three hours for me to arrive just so they could sing happy birthday to me. Can you believe that? And then we had cake and a celebration. Best birthday ever. And they gave that to me. And I thought, what have I given to them? We went to explore, but it wasn't just a sightseeing tour. It was so that God can change our hearts and begin to cast a vision of how we can be involved. I had the privilege of preaching at one of the churches there near the village, and it was extraordinary because, well, that service, by the way, started at 9.30, and we ended at 12.30, and I cut my sermon short, believe it or not. But God was there. people were singing joyfully when they had nothing. They gave an offering when they had nothing. We rejoiced, and when I gave the altar call, they came forward. There were probably 60, 70 there, 30 or more at least came forward and wanted to pray with me, and I had the privilege of, sometimes they understood English, sometimes they didn't, but we prayed in the spirit. Pastor Rich was talking about one of the ladies in the uh, village, and she had that word in her home, may God be with us all the time, and it occurred to me as I looked at that dirt hut. You know, when Jesus came, he didn't come, uh, my ex- he didn't come to the United States in the 21st century sleeping in a bed like I sleep in every night. He came to a place that was much more like she was living in. And he did that because he said, this is the pearl of great price. And the world may have forgotten them, but I haven't forgotten them. And when I raise up my church, I'm gonna raise up a people who say, I remember you, I care for you, I love you, and we can make a difference. Martin, thank you for giving us a sense of your passion and vision. Thank you, Margaret, and your beautiful children for sharing this with us because I know it comes as a cost it comes at a great cost for him but we want to join in that effort and so this is my question to you and my hope I gave a an invitation there in that that little village church that we want to partner with I don't know exactly what God is going to have us do but Martin has established he's built a beautiful guest house He's got another one that he's going to finish in June. You know why he built that? So you and I could come and live and, you know, be there in relative comfort. Now, the fans stop working at 1 a.m. in the morning and, you know, that kind of a thing. But, Martin, you've done an extraordinary job, and we want to be a part of it. My vision is this, that we can send at least once a year, but the reality is we could send teams over and over and over again of course there are finances involved there are issues involved but what I would like to establish is a Malawi strategy mission team to for people who have in our church who have a heart to to help us in that ministry maybe you'll go maybe you won't maybe you'll just help us be a part of the strategy but that you would be the kind of person that says you know what my heart has been touched today and I think I have something to offer. You know, Jim, as a carpenter, had something to offer. Uh, Martin here, he is an accountant and, uh, well, he owns a trucking company. I mean, the guy, he's a professor, he does everything. Every one of us has something to offer if we think about it. And so my, my call to you today is this. Are you willing to say to God this morning, Lord, I'm yours, I'm willing to be used. Take me as I am, and I'm willing to go and become because I know of your great love. I want to invite you to stand with me right now. Again, it was a true privilege to to go and be a part. It was humbling. Can I just tell you one more story, just kind of at the... uh, Yeah, I'm a little over, but... uh, At the end of the trip, we went on a safari. Uh, That was a treat. 
we all paid for it ourselves, but uh, we thought, you know, you're in Africa. Why not try this? And so we spent one night in a, a kind of a, a resort area, I guess you'd call it, and experienced a, res- a safari. Now, there's a lot of stories I could tell with that, but we had gone out the, that night, and we saw a cheetah and her cubs, and the cheetah had just made a kill. Well, it was a fascinating thing. It's rather unusual, actually, to see that and beautiful in a lot of ways, although my wife looked at the picture. I said, and she said, bad kitty. You know, that's kind of her, her response. But then, then as we're heading back to the camp, we see a lion who has also got a kill of an impala and a lioness, and they're kind of going at the kill. And, of course, I'm, I'm in this uh, open open vehicle and it's dark as all get out and we've got one light shining on the lion everybody's attention is on the lion and it's is absolutely dark and it occurs to me you know there are probably other lions out here too (laughs) and you know we don't know because we can't see them it's dark outside here Sure enough, as just as, uh, two minutes after I thought of that, a lioness comes ripping out behind our vehicle and heads to get the kill. They could have gotten me pretty easily and have been plump and, and good eating, you know, that kind of a thing. Well, that night, as we go to the, back to the camp, we each have our, I guess you call them a chalet is what they called them, each our own individual chalets. Well, that's, that's very nice, and I'm sure their, their accommodations are, are pretty nice. But in order to get to the chalet, you have to have a guard go with you. The guard is armed, and he's got a flashlight, and he makes sure that you get to your individual chalet safely, you know, because there are pythons and animals and whatnot out there. So I get into the chalet, and he shows me, and he says, first thing you need to know is the generator stops at 9 o'clock. So at that point, it's lights out and the um, solar power is, is clicked on. So you can't plug anything in. You've got just a little bit of light for the night, solar power. So just be aware of that. Fine. Uh, but again, it's pretty isolated. You're hearing animal noises everywhere. And he then says, uh, over here is your drum. And I said, well, what's the drum for? He says, well, in case of emergency, pound on the drum. And I'm thinking, you probably will hear the scream before I get to the drum, but it was a great, great experience. I want you to know, thank you for allowing us to go, but I'd like to see a lot of you go too. Not because of a safari or not because of the experience of being able to say I was in Malawi, because it'll change your heart. You'll be grateful for what you have, no doubt, but you'll also realize that there is a pearl of great price, a mass of humanity that God cares about, and he has blessed you and me because he wants to be a blessing to others. Let's not forget that.